Welcome, this is the second workshop with Unity, but by request, I'll be restarting from kind of the beginning. I'll go through the content that I did last week a little bit faster because um, we have gone through it once, but we'll be doing everything from the beginning. And then once I'm through the first kind of presentation bit, I'm gonna go into Unity and we're gonna do hopefully three different projects. Uh, and you're wondering how are we gonna do that in the span of two hours? Well, uh, I'm hoping that the first two will only be about half hour each. And the last one, we'll see how far we get. That's kind of the question. Um, where are we going to start? I'm, if you're wondering why I'm wearing headphones, it's because I'm also uh, recording this. So anybody who couldn't make it today will be able to uh, see this afterwards. And also, um, I can post it and say, hey, look, I did a workshop. So uh, hopefully all this setup is going good. I ho hopefully won't have to manage too much of that. But we're going to get into... Uh, my first introduction here. So this is the topic for the day, uh, making games with Unity. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about is how to ro rapidly prototype designs because as I will explain in a moment, Unity is getting into a lot more markets than just uh, game development. And that might be of interest to some of you. So the first thing I want to do is show off a presentation from the keynote, which is what I did last time. I'm actually going to show a different video clip just to keep things fresh. So give me a moment here while I load that up. And hopefully the audio and everything works as well. All right, that was from the Unite 2022 keynote. Uh, really big conference that Unity had just in November. Uh, one of the first ones they've had in a, in a while because of the COVID. So they went over a lot of different technologies. They had a lot of different showcases and that was just one uh, that was a little bit different from the one I showed last time. Uh, this one focused a little bit more on graphics and different kinds of platforms. As you may have noticed, one of those was pretty obviously in VR, the basketball one basketball one, I believe. And that's part of what makes Unity such a great platform and why we're gonna be talking about it because it allows us to deploy rapidly to many different types of devices, whether that's mobile, whether that's consoles, et cetera. And that's one of the things I'll cover in uh, my demonstration today. So back to what I have prepared, let's skip through that. So who am I, why am I talking to you? My name is Noah, I am a Bachelor's of Science in Computing student. Uh, actually graduate, I should say, um, not student anymore, but I actually would want to take my master's if possible. Perhaps some of you are already ahead of me on that, but I have been in the uh, games development industry for five years now to the point where I'm considered a senior and I have a currently a senior position at Unity as a game developer. Uh, and interestingly enough, most of Unity does not have uh, internal game development, but uh, with the platform that I'm doing, as you can imagine, there's lots of demos and samples and things that they want to do for Unity and get people being creative. And that's kind of why I decided to do these workshops because I want more people possibly being creative and being creators. And with directly in Unity, that's something that we're gonna talk about at a more low level engineering, art, uh, design, that kind of stuff. And all of that's involved if you're building your own games. So if you are doing an indie game like I have, you are doing the art, you are doing the sound, you are doing animations, you are doing uh, level design, you are doing uh, UI menus, you have to do everything because that's everything that's involved in a game. If you're working on a bigger team, like for the design-a-thon, you may have teams, you might be able to specialize and do something more uh, specific. You might be the sound designer, you might be the level designer, 
you might do art and animation, whatever you, your fancy, in order to help the project come together. Uh, I've also taught at Lambda College, teaching C Sharp and HTML, and uh, I have experience in education in that sort of fashion. So if you have any questions, don't be afraid to interrupt me. Sometimes I speak fast, sometimes I just go on a roll. And if you do have questions, just feel free. So something that we're kind of here on the track for is the UBC Design League Designathon. Uh, so that's happening this weekend, 18th and 19th. Uh, just quickly, some highlights there, the check-ins in the morning, there's an opening ceremony. We're going to talk about the prompts and what the actual thing you're going to be doing for. So I'm going to give Mina the floor for a second so she can highlight uh, the available prompts and then, of course, uh, anything else she wants to say. Thanks, Mina. Uh, hopefully, the recording did catch most of that. But either way, uh, I have the information here for you guys to see. And uh, yeah, so that's this weekend. So there's limited spots. So uh, as Mina said, registration will close if we do fill up because there's only so much uh, space on 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 site. And I don't. There's no virtual component for this. For this. So yeah, it's just limited uh, limited seating, you could say. Uh, yeah, I will be there, as Mina mentioned. Uh, I will be doing more workshops. So the first day on the 18th, I will be doing a game dev workshop and also a getting into the gaming industry workshop. So I'll talk about it just briefly today about kind of how I got into the games and uh, why I think you guys should do certain things to get into games. Um, but we'll also be talking about basically this same kind of workshop that I'll be doing towards the end about actually getting into Unity. But I'll get, I'm going to do all this again with the prompt specifically in mind um, at the beginning of the day. So once you get the prompt and you guys have your teams, I'm going to go over, OK, this is the prompt. This is what you're designing. Let's talk about how actually to do the, exactly that with Unity. So that's what our first workshop at 12 is going to be. And then 7 is just going to kind of be a take a break. Let's have a chat. And uh, I can answer some other questions. Um, one other thing I wanted to focus on, um, so the design-a-thon is a type of hackathon, you could say. Um, maybe you could talk to Mina more about how she started it and why she started it. I talked to her before, and it's a very interesting story. Um, hackathons are for all sorts of different things, robotics, uh, architecture, engineering, like we'll, we'll be doing. Um, but we also have game-specific ones. There's Global Game Jam, which happened right before, or actually during, the last uh, workshop that we had here. And in fact, uh, I've closed my shirt now to keep my lapel mic down, but I actually attended the weekend event that was in downtown Vancouver at on-site, 48 hours for us to build a game jam uh, game. And we had the, this year, the theme was Roots. So all they tell you is, hey, your theme is Roots, make a game. And of course, that could be ancestral roots, that could be plant roots, that could be whatever. 
just go do it. And because it's so fo focused on game development, uh, you guys just have to come up with what you're doing. So some, some examples uh, in the picture there, those aren't from this specific year, uh, but those are from many different years of Global Games Jam. And that happens every year on a big uh, global game jam like this. And there's lots of other events that happen throughout the year at different locations. So you can always look up you know, virtual game jams uh, online. They have all over the world, and because they're virtual, you can join them pretty much any time. So maybe you're too busy during the semester to do any hackathons, you can't make it out to the design-a-thon. The very least, maybe I've prompted you now to, during your summer break, go find a game jam and go make some games. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to show you guys what I built. Uh, it's actually my team, I had a team of four. One person had never coded, never touched Unity before, uh, and they really spent most of their time uh, learning and, and doing a lot of research on documentation. Uh, I built the multiplayer, which was a, actually a huge headache, more than I thought it would be, but I took on the most advanced part of the project. And uh, another person did the animations of the player and the movement of the player, and our final person did uh, custom models of the plants that you're about to see in this demo, and also um, the throwing mechanic. And uh, the, how the game works is, there are plants that randomly grow on either garden, either player's garden. It could be red or green. The green ones are okay. The red ones give you a score. If you get too many points, you lose. So if the green ones come in contact with red ones, vice versa, they turn the good ones bad. So you can get points by uh, throwing your bad vegetables to the other side and that's fine. Or you can throw your good vegetables to the other side and make them land on the bad vegetables, and that works too, because then they'll also turn bad. Uh, so I think this should work. Yeah. So uh, not much in the way of uh, audio. So it's multiplayer, it's networked, you can play across the world using Unity Gaming Services, and that's free, um, free for small projects. We'll talk a little bit more about those. Once the other player connects, there's a countdown, and that little gold disc you can see is kind of like the aiming reticle for the player. So the one player kind of <laughs> already starting to throw his things, and eventually the other player is trying to get in position to actually interact with the objects and throw them. Eventually, they kind of get this back and forth. And yeah, so we had people trying it out. People never don't play many games, and it was pretty intuitive enough to pick up. It's just WASD and mouse and very simple input. Uh, system for that. So as you can see, uh, this player strategy was just put them all in one place. So when the player tries to throw them, he can only throw one at a time. So he ends up kind of overloaded and eventually loses. So not a big fancy menu or anything like that, or any fancy flows, just something very simple game mechanic. And to be honest, that's kind of what I would expect from a design-a-thon or hackathon level project. It's a very simple design, one core element, one core gameplay mechanic, just working on. Uh, I guess you could say we went above and doing two core game, gameplay mechanics because we wanted to add networking specifically, um, but that was kind of my own personal challenge as the uh, as kind of the quote unquote more experienced game dev. So I had some slides from last time. I'm going to quickly go over them again. I'm not going to spend as much time as I did last time, but let's just talk about it again. So why using a game engine? Why are we using Unity? Why are we talking about Unity? And what else are we able to talk about? Well, game engines are good for more than just engineers. Uh, people from all over the gaming sphere can use them, and as we'll talk about in a, mi in a minute, uh, even outside of games, we're starting to see people using game engines. So character motion, character art, environment art, lighting, all this kind of stuff is all involved in the game engine, can be done in the game engine without needing external tools like Blender, Maya, etc. Yes, you can use those external tools, import them as well, so that's also an option, but for many, uh, it's simpler to kind of have everything in one package, and that's what a lot of game engines offer. But not just games anymore. We're seeing a lot of other purposes being used, piecemeal elements. Um, one example I'll give for uh, this slide is uh, netcode for game objects, which is what I spent that weekend learning. Netcode for game objects is a Unity-specific uh, technology, which involves uh, figuring out what position a game object is in, such as a character or one of those vegetables, and then sending that data across the network so that the other player knows, hey, that thing's being thrown, or hey, that thing has now moved. And uh, funny enough, uh, recently, there, they talked about it on the Twitch stream, there is a, a platform uh, that's being developed where the client, as in the, the player, is running Unreal Engine, but the server is running Unity netcode for game objects. So even though these are two competitors that I'll talk about in a moment, 
they are using cross technology in this way. So we're seeing uh, tech more and more for other industries. Uh, and the last example I'll give is something called digital twit, which is architecting, designing, using sensors, using other APIs, cameras, et cetera, to build digital versions of places, uh, locations such as airports, hotels, other big uh, businesses that need uh, basically a digital version of their property so they can manage a lot of different aspects. For example, airport security, there might be a problem over on that side of the airport and you can get all the information from the sensors, kind of feed that through and then alert security personnel, send them where we need to go, whatever. So a lot of different interesting things that they're doing now with uh, game engines, including um, something I'll show you briefly, uh, which is film studios, film rendering. So rather than sending things out to render farms using Adobe After Effects or these other programs, they're doing rendering right in Unity using the power of real-time lighting, ray tracing technology, et cetera, in order to build uh, full feature films using Unity technology and other game engines as well. Even Unreal is doing this. I won't go through the in-depth comparison I did last time, so I'll just leave this on the screen for a moment. Uh, some of the big names that I was comparing, Unity, Unreal Engine, CryEngine, Godot, and as an example of something that's not so big, uh, Panda 3D. Unity Engine has one of the biggest uh, communities with Unity Technologies and the Unity Learn programs and a lot of the other programs that we're actually gonna be going through today. Unreal Engine is also a very big program, but it's uh, founded foundationally on C++, which is a little bit more complicated of a language uh, and has other memory requirements, but can also be more powerful. And uh, they're very well known for high graphics fidelity. Same thing with CryEngine, although they're even more specialized, I would say, uh, smaller community, more specialized games, um, which I'll show you in a second. Godot Engine is a really cool one that's actually pretty new. It's very similar to both Unreal and Unity, kind of takes a lot of elements from both of those, um, but it's also free open source. So uh, a lot of community development, um, community implementations, uh, and a lot of other things that allow it, because it's such an open software, anybody can go in and edit things, also means that if you need really custom functionality out of your game engine, then you can build that right in without worrying about licensing, et cetera. Um, one other thing I'll talk about since we're on the slide, um, there is visual programming languages or visual pipelines, depending on how you want to call them, for most of these uh, game engines, save uh, Panda 3D. And that allows for programming-like behavior without the need for code, period. Basically, you can have code-like blocks, such as uh, trigger, so when something is triggered, perform some other behavior. And all of the four game engines, like I said, say Panda 3D, have this kind of visual programming now that allows uh, people that don't have uh, any in-depth knowledge of the specific programming language to get those specific kind of effects uh, from the game and have game logic um, without needing to write code. And then one last thing, um, marketplaces, asset stores, et cetera, that allow you to get both free and paid assets so that you can start building faster and don't have to spend as much time, for example, on, on art or on certain logic uh, that might be pre-built already. Somebody already created some package that has all the different elements for some mechanic. I showed last week um, a key door mechanic. So for example, I say last week, I mean the last workshop. Uh, without needing to program a key door mechanic in yourself, you can find an asset that was free that allows you to just drag and drop and say, hey, this thing's a key, this is the door, when those two things come together, either because they're in the player's inventory or because they're close enough, then the door opens, things like that. And we'll talk about a few of them today as well. Some big names with, associated with each of these game engines get you some better examples and some better ideas. Hopefully you know some of these, if not all. So Unity is uh, much more involved in the mobile sphere, and I'll talk about that when I talk about some numbers. Um, Unreal Engine has some really big games but doesn't really do too much 2D. And the 2D they do do uh, is kind of more 2.5D. And I give an example there, Octopath Traveler. CryEngine, almost exclusively no 2D. Go, Godot Engine, most of the uh, releases right now are 2D, but I believe that's because it's such a new technology, a new engine. And so 3D development takes a lot more time usually. So we're only just now starting to see some 3D games coming out uh, using Godot Engine, but some really cool 2D games are coming out as well. Panda 3D, 
it's really hard to find examples of anything. <laughs> it's just not a very well-known uh, engine and not a very well used. So there are both engines that are extremely popular like Unity and Unreal and game engines that are extremely specialized or just haven't really gotten the same kind of traction. And that's fine. Um, sometimes it's, they have a very specialized reason to use that game engine or maybe they just they don't really have the same advantages as the other competitors. And that's, that's what it is. It's a marketplace, right? So briefly, uh, just some uh, just some uh, examples of my journey. So I'm not trying to sell you on Unity here, but I just wanted to give you some numbers, kind of why I ended up getting into it. So in 2014, I was looking to go to a programming course, and I just centered on um, computer science with games development. That was kind of my focus. And at that time, Unreal was beginning to ramp up, and Unity was kind of already in the market, and my professors decided, well, C++ is a language we want our students to learn, and what kind of game engine runs on C++? Unreal. So I learned uh, Unreal and Unity Engine. Uh, I learned Unreal and C++, sorry. By 2017, I was getting ready to graduate, and I'd seen that Unreal was growing, but its competitor, Unity, was growing just as much, even more. So while I had learned C++ and I had made a couple simple projects with Unreal, I decided that on the side, while I was finalizing some other projects, I would learn C Sharp and Unity Engine and see how hard it was to learn a whole quote unquote new programming language, even though you know C++ and C Sharp are uh, very similar, they're, they're based off each other's. Um, and a lot of the, the new features, for example, of C Sharp kind of backwards compatible versions for Python and Lua, and just uh, to kind of taking the best from all languages. So I, I learned Unity and I published my first game that was Project Lance, which if I go all the way back, you can see in the bottom right corner, uh, that little, little mobile game, very simple graphics. I just drew this stuff myself and I just published it on the Google Play Store because I didn't have any iOS devices, I didn't have a Mac device. I couldn't publish for iOS, I didn't know how. But that was my first real game that was available to download. And I even had um, Google leaderboards and a few other uh, features that I figured out. Um, by 2021, which is the end of this specific graph, uh, Unity had a few less releases. Unreal also a few less releases, obviously a year of COVID. Uh, but still, they are now the biggest competitors with unknown, i.e. custom game engines or not willing to say game engines. Um, really falling to the wayside. And now most people are using some of these biggest names, including even things like Game Maker or RPG Maker, which aren't strictly game engines, or perhaps they are specialized game engines, depending on how you want to look at it. And so from the keynote that I showed you at the beginning with the fancy presentation, uh, here are some basic information of kind of where Unity stands now. These are their numbers though, so take that with a grain of salt, but um, 3 billion active players every month, that's a lot of, of players. And that's across every platform, across all devices, all the players, all the uh, consumers of Unity Technologies products. And of course, that means 50% of those games that are on mobile, on PC, and, are, and consoles are made with Unity. Hence, half, at least half, if not more, of the players playing games are playing a Unity game at some point. 58% of VR made with Unity, so that's another big space that they're in. And of the top grossing mobile games, 72% are Unity products as well. So these are numbers that kind of, I kind of stepped back and was like, wow, really impressed with uh, what Unity's um, putting out now and the kind of traction that they've gained over the years. So if somebody says, well, what did you uh, learn at the Unity workshop? You can say, well, maybe if I'm gonna use a game engine, maybe it should be Unity because Really, that's the most successful thing right now. But let's get into some more practical stuff because that's really what I wanted to focus on today was using Unity, building things with Unity, and actually giving you some practical examples of different kinds of games that we're going to build. So today, these are the steps we're going to go through. Uh, we went through the first couple steps last time, um, but I will go through them again because we have some people here who might not have Unity yet. So first thing we're going to do is get Unity Hub. I'll go through that. We're going to grab a specific version of Unity, which is the latest, quote unquote, uh, stable release. So that will be the first thing that will tell you to install. And that's just fine for what we need. Then we're going to do two things. We're going to create, uh, well, we'll do one thing at a time. We're going to go through the 2D platformer micro game. And then we're going to go through the 
FPS micrograms. So those things are what I believe won't take us too, too long. The micrograms are, as you can imagine by uh, their name, fully built uh, micro, small, small slices of gameplay for those uh, particular genres. So the 2D platformer micro game has everything a 2D platform is gonna need from level start to maybe collectibles to level end. And the FPS micro game is gonna have everything first person camera, it's gonna have some gunplay, it's gonna have some other things. And we're gonna go through all those different uh, elements. And the cool thing about these micro games, once we uh, install them and we load them up, they have tutorials built in to show you all the different elements. It's not just a project that's there and it's not doing anything, which is I sometimes have a problem with other examples um, that Unity might put out where they're just, hey, here's a game that we made, look through it, but they don't actually have any steps or show you things. The cool thing about the micro games, they actually have tutorials built in. They say, hey, you wanna edit this thing? Let's do that, let's try a few things, modding and stuff like that. And then the final thing, we'll see how much time we have for today. We're gonna create a brand new project. We're gonna import a game kit, which is a bunch of assets, a bunch of stuff pre-ready to go. And we're gonna go through that and see how do I set up my first kind of game, basically from scratch, although with some assets provided. So we will talk about asset creation. We'll create some custom stuff as well, so you can see how to do that. Uh, but the focus, on, the focus on today will hopefully be how do I get a game from start to finish in a rapid uh, manner because you don't have a lot of time for the design-a-thon. So if you're planning on attending a design-a-thon, hackathon, game jam, you need to be able to build a game start to finish. And our game jam game, I would say, probably took only about eight hours of development time, but we spent about 20 hours in total because we had a lot of different new things we were discovering. How do you use net code? How do you get two different computers to talk to each other? Not how do you get uh, one computer to have two instances of Unity uh, running so you could play locally, stuff like that. So a lot of your development time, I imagine, in the Designathon will be reading tutorials, watching YouTube videos, watching Unity specific provided Unity uh, videos, tutorials, but also just looking up some guy on YouTube and finding out, hey, how do I do this thing? Because uh, Unity tutorials have very specific uh, flows that we're gonna follow, and we might have to go beyond that and find some other mechanics because we want our game to have something different than just this provided logic, right? So we might have to figure out how to do that. And of course, we might write some code because I wanna show you how to do that, but we're also gonna do some stuff without any code at all and show you how to do logic just with, for example, visual scripting, for example, uh, changing assets and other things that you'll need to do as part of your game creation that's not engineering. So we're gonna do this part live. We're gonna go and get Unity Hub. As you can imagine, I already have that prepared, but I'm gonna go walk you through the steps and give you a few moments to do that. So let's load that up. Don't need that anymore. Let's grab this. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna go on Uni's website, the basic page, if I get rid of this extra URL, if I just go to unity.com, basically the same thing. Bring your vision to life, download Unity. If I click on that, it's gonna bring me to, I think that other page that I was on, which is just the step-by-steps of how to do that. So first thing, we're gonna download Unity Hub. That's what we're using to manage our projects, manage our installs of the versions of Unity. And if you're looking at older tutorials or you're looking at older templates, you may need to install an older version of Unity just so you're not waiting for things to upgrade. Um, that might be faster. Uh, but you can also change version of Unity. You can upgrade things on the fly. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So. Make sure you're downloading it for your appropriate OS. And if you happen to have a brand new, uh, well, brand new, quote unquote, 21, 22, whatever, uh, Macs that are running either Intel or uh, the Mac M1 silicone chips, make sure you install the correct version because I made that mistake and I was wondering why Unity kept crashing, but it was because I had the wrong, uh, wrong processor version, basically. So once we do that, again, this is a Mac, so I won't click the download for Windows button. I'm gonna click the download for Mac button. That's gonna prompt me to do the setup. You go through the setup, pretty easy, just like any other program, you install it. And once you are done, you will have Unity Hub somewhere in your files. 
Um, so, once you bring that over, if it wants to go over to the other screen, hmm, I have to open it from that other screen. Interesting. Try that again. Oh, you know what? Yeah, it's because this is in full screen mode. One thing I don't like about Max. Okay. So, slide over, Unity Hub, boom, that loads up. And here, if it's the first time you're installing Unity Hub, you won't have anything. It'll say, you have no projects, please start a project. But before you can start a project, you need a uh, editor to install. This is just the hub. This is where we manage our projects and, and our installs. So we're gonna go to the install section. We're gonna click install editor. And the first thing, in my case, it's already installed, but the first one available, again, make sure it's the correct processor, if that's a problem for you. And then you click install. It will download on the Wi-Fi. It's actually not been so bad. Today it's been a little bit slower, I think. Um, and you can get your version of Unity installed in. It should all uh, just go from there. Once you have your version of Unity installed, you don't need this page anymore. Go back to the projects page, and this is where we're actually going to get started. So I got rid of the, the other versions of stuff I had. I've left uh, one thing here, which is the game kit, which is the last thing we'll do, just because I wanted to make sure that that uh, imported correctly and, and all that. And I'll, I'll get back to that when we talk about that final project. But we're going to start with the first project I mentioned, which is the 2D platformer. And that's because a lot of Unity games are 2D games, especially mobile. When we said mobile is a really big market for Unity, 2D is usually all you need. Number one, because it's much lighter on the phone, you won't have to worry about uh, draining battery life, you won't have to worry about a lot of other things that come with 3D games, especially processing time. Uh, and you can also run on a lot older devices. And if you imagine if you're targeting uh, a global market, a lot of the global market is running older spec devices. They're not going to be able to run 3D content as good. And so if you really want to target everybody, uh, 2D games is what you're going to focus on. So here in our templates, we have uh, templates organized by different categories, including, you know, just everything. Some of the new ones that we'll talk about uh, is a, these are the new core templates that Unity has built. Um, but in the core section, it's all the sort of basic things that we're going to start. And here it gives you a few good examples of things you can do. So if you want to build a VR project, I know one of the, the team members I had on the weekend at the Game Jam, um, he was mostly experienced with VR projects because he had a VR device he wanted to develop for VR devices. He actually hadn't made many classical games like 2D, 3D games with Unity, he spent most of his time in VR. So he had to actually kind of adapt. Uh, same thing with AR, if you're doing AR projects, um, those are really cool to play around with. And then first person and third person core games, these have just a few basic stuff to get you started in those, um, in those types of worlds, but they really don't come with any game mechanics. It's just, here's a player, here's how you run around, uh, here's how, for example, the physics body interacts with uh, ramps or stairs or things like that. So they're very uh, simple projects. The samples, these are really impressive samples that they have put together for a few different things. For example, the test track is some com uh, collaboration with Volvo. They have this super high def uh, using I believe the high def pipeline, which is sort of a competitor to Unreal. And uh, it allows you to play around with this car, drive it around in a realistic uh, test track and uh, have, uh, I believe, first person and third person driving mechanics. Um, so maybe a little bit advanced if you're starting your very first driving game, which is why, come over to this section, they have, for example, a karting micro game. So a lot of the mechanics in the karting micro game, we won't be talking about this today, um, but the karting micro game mechanics actually kind of all follow the same mechanics from the test track. Sure, you have a different render pipeline, which means a little bit more advanced right, lighting and rendering, but that's kind of accessory stuff. The core mechanics like suspension and uh, steering control, all that kind of stuff is very similar from one thing to the other, including friction, sliding, uh, or drifting, things like that. Uh, and other couple examples, just basic sample scenes so you can test out the differences between, say, URP and HDRP. So briefly, URP is the universal render pipeline, which is built for multiple platform development. If you're going to be building your game on PC and later releasing it on Nintendo Switch, the universal rental pipeline is going to give you a little bit lighter 
rendering capabilities so you can, for example, be able to play it on a switch, which is not a very high spec device. And HDRP, which is kind of the opposite. If you really are trying to get all the power out of your graphics uh, card for that machine, the HDRP is gonna allow you to do uh, re real-time ray tracing and other high def uh, mechanics that it all, it all demos in there. Finally, something I mentioned in the slides, the Cinematic Studio is something that Unity is really pushing towards now, which is how do you use a game engine for something that's not a game? How can you use Unreal Engine in order to build a film studio and have rendering of your film inside an engine with all the advantages of the engine? Now, the stuff we're actually gonna be doing, 2D platform micro game and the FPS micro game. So I would suggest probably download both now. In fact, I wanted to make sure uh, it's I thought I actually had the template downloaded, but that's okay. We can re-download it and make sure that uh, we're all doing this together. Hopefully that doesn't take too long, but the template should be pretty light. Um, so feel free to download both. Hopefully you've got your editor installed at this point. And if uh, for some reason, since I'm here, if you have multiple versions of the editor installed because you were playing around already before, you can change uh, which editor you're gonna actually launch here at the, this top menu. Okay, so that didn't take very long at all. Now I have the 2D platformer micro game. Here I can name my project. So we're gonna do that. Unity 2D platformer PVC. And uh, it allows you to pick a location. I'm just gonna leave it in the default, which is uh, the projects folder I put. So first thing it's gonna do, is now I'm gonna create the project. It's gonna download all the template stuff for us automatically. If you're going without a template, if you're using one of the core projects, then it's gonna give you an empty editor with just the basics. And you're not gonna have, for example, uh, any lighting system like Universal Render Pipeline or HD, HD Render Pipeline. Um, and you'll have to import those packages manually, which we'll show, I'll show you how to do when we get to the uh, 3D game kit. Um, but for now, we're starting from this basics. It's gonna have everything we need uh, automatically. And in fact, if I go back to the new project menu, I believe I can see everything that's going to include by going to 2D platformer, I think read more. Yeah. So under the packages tab, I can see all the packages that are included with this template. And these are all the different systems that Unity has, has uh, provided for free as part of the Unity editor that allow for us to create this uh, micro game. So some examples of things we can see here, there's a Unity UI system. Of course, we need that if we have any UI. There's an animation system, so animating characters or other objects. There's an audio system, all these kind of systems. If you're building a prototype for either a design-a-thon or just work, for example, if somebody says, hey, can you throw together a 3D prototype of, of the building or something, I don't know. Uh, you might not need audio or other things like that. So you don't have to uh, install those packages uh, specifically. And then that's why they've created this sort of package system. Okay, it opened on my other screen, so let me bring that over. So, Actually, I won't do that because there's another window that popped up, which is part of the stuff I want to show. So I've opened the uh, 2D platformer micro game, and this window has also opened automatically. So it's introduction. Make your own platformer game. So that's what we're going to be basically doing today. In the project, you will find preloaded scenes, scripts, audios, tutorials, and more to inspire you to create your own uh, 2D platformer. There's a quick start options that gives you step-to-step -step tutorials if you've never used Unity before. If you're a little bit more familiar, you're welcome to jump right to the scenes and start playing around. But because this is the tutorials, as we talked about, we are gonna go through these tutorials. Before I load that up, however, we're actually gonna go to the official uh, Unity Learn page based around this micro game, which you can find on the uh, learn.unity platform. So let's start with this. So uh, it might be hard to read there, but it's just learn.unity.com. And there is sort of the pathways to all your different learning. If you're doing one of their example projects or you just want to learn a little bit more about a specific mechanic that you're building, uh, this is a pretty good place. But like I said, feel free to look up YouTube videos or anything else because however you learn best is really how I would suggest you try and do your learning. Uh, and perhaps one of that ways by listening to somebody live 
stepping you through it. So let's do that. Um, some information here that they have on the website. One thing is they talk about how to set up your first micro game, which actually, yeah, I had, had that open. Uh, and this kind of walks you through some of the stuff that we were just doing. So installing the latest editor, uh, making sure that you've selected the right kind of things, creating the micro game project, et cetera, et cetera. So if you ever need a reminder, how the heck did I get st started? How did I get set up? You can find that right, right here in the, uh, in the first intro blurb. So uh, you can also kind of mark these steps as complete as you go through them and remember where your progress is if you have to leave it off another day. And the last thing it says, okay, after you've opened the micro game, you're greeted with a choice to either load the tutorials or head straight to the scene. So we're going to load the tutorials. Uh, tutorials appear in a window. We're going to go step by step through those tutorials together. Some other things that uh, it might point us to later or might even do while we're here is modding the game. And that's, of course, how we're doing our first bit of creation for today is how do we change something in the game so that it's our game and not Unity's game. And that's going to be our first bit of creation. In my opinion, that's uh, one of the easiest ways to get started, to get learning, is to start with something there and start tweaking parameters and figuring out what things do in the Unity editor. And we can only really do that if we have something to tweak. So uh, back to our project. Let's hit load tutorials. That shouldn't take very long. There we go. Drink of water. How's our time? OK, we'll take a break in a bit, but well, let's keep going. So in this tutorial, we're exploring the basics of the editor. Feel free to do this with me if you've managed to get everything set up to this point. Hopefully, I haven't sped through and you're still downloading the version of Unity. But if even if so, you can always review this because, as I mentioned, we are recording. And hopefully, yeah, just double checking that you can view the tutorials on screen. I might even uh, shrink my camera because I'm not that important. OK. Back to the tutorials. Actually lost the window that I was looking at. So let's go back to show all windows. There we go. That's what I wanted. OK, so how do you even play the game? How do you test what you have? Because this is supposed to be a completed micro game, ready to go, right? Well, this is showing us that at the very top of our Unity editor window, we have uh, options for testing our game. Here you can see it's highlighted. There's a play button beside it, a pause, and a step frame button, um, which we won't need to probably touch on right away. This is how we're going to start and stop uh, the actual game project. And it's probably easiest if I maybe shrink the editor window so I can leave this tutorial window open all the time. And I don't need this stuff right now. I don't need this one right now either. Okay. So um, we're going to press play and see what happens. First thing it's going to do, it's going to recompile any logic. And right off the bat, we have some music. I'm going to mute my version, and thank you for muting yours. And now we actually are in the game. So we don't know what the controls are because it hasn't really told us. We can always play around and try and find out what those are. Looks like I can use the arrow keys. Looks like I can use WSD. Spacebar lets me jump. OK, well, I didn't know any of that until I just tried it out. But maybe we can uh, create a tutorial for our player or something like that. But the moment we can go through, we can see there is some kind of collectible here. I jump to collect it. I can jump over what I presume is an enemy. Let's see if it is. I walked into it and I've died. Yes, so this is bad. And just to give you a better view, let me also do one other thing, which it may or may not tell us to do in a moment. Um, can I do this? No, OK, it wants us to just go through the story. OK, we'll, we'll come back to that. But it was still big enough, I think, on the screen that everybody, everybody saw what I was doing. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is Take a look at the player, because that's the thing that we're controlling. That's the thing that's moving around on screen. It's kind of really obvious. And we're going to start modding the game by changing some values here. So here is our inspector window that we're looking at right now. I should have mentioned the hierarchy window, which is what we selected earlier. But in the inspector window, this is going to have all of the parameters in the components of the different game objects. And that's uh, sort of the flow that Unity development is in. We have game objects, 
which are in the game, they're in the 2D or 3D space that we're playing in. And on those game objects, we have different components, which have different fields for different things. In this case, it's a number field, probably an integer field, could be a float field, not sure off the top of my head. We can actually test that really quick. Uh, if you don't know what uh, integers and floats are, don't worry, it's just a programming term. Uh, it just means does it have decimal points or not. Max speed, if we try to enter 0.5, for example, does it let us? It looks like it does. So that's not an integer field, that's a float field, which means it accepts decimals. And uh, in this specific tutorial, is it asking us to change it to a specific number? I don't think so. Uh, change it to 10, I think is what it says. Okay, so we'll change it to 10, that's fine. And now we've changed the max speed of the player, in theory, to 10. So that's what that field is called, and sorry, hopefully that's what it will do. This field is on a component in the game object. The component is called the player controller, and in brackets here, it is telling us that it's a script. So this is a C-sharp script that somebody has wrote in order to control the player. A lot of times, if you're building from a template or a sample, or even just one of their example projects, like the 3D example, it will come with a character controller that is ready to go, and you can start using it. You don't have to start writing code in order to get, for example, a player up and running. Somebody's already done that. So let's not reinvent the wheel here. We've changed our number, and feel free to read through the tutorial in more detail if you, if you want. But now that we've uh, adjusted our change, all we have to do is hit play again. It's going to quickly rethink, oh, okay, that's a new number, and back into the game we go. So changing things, uh, what I will say in between run times, meaning in between playing the game, uh, is still pretty fast because the game will recompile pretty quickly. Now our max speed, we're zooming. And uh, we're going so fast, in fact, that I didn't have time to jump over that bit. But that's okay. So that's our first modding of something in the game, in this case, the player controller. Now we can go on to some other examples of how we're gonna start playing around with this game, making it our own. Uh, in this case, we're gonna look more, a little bit more at the editor stuff here. So tutorial two, editor basics saying, hey, you've made some change here. Do you wanna save that change? Because we're gonna be switching over to something else. Uh, we can say yes and it's going to reload the tutorial, which is put it on back on this screen for some reason. Okay, now we're on back of the tutorial. Let's bring this a little bit bigger. So the next thing uh, we're gonna be touching on is changing uh, how we interact with the object. So before, we clicked on the name in this left side menu, which is called the hierarchy. It's just a list of all the objects that are currently um, in the scene, the scene being all the elements in the current um, runtime of the, of the game. So when you press play, everything in the scene will, will load uh, into memory and, and run any actions on them. And here, well, I'll, just, I'll just go through the tutorial, click start. We're gonna look at how to kind of move around the scene and play around inside this space. So this is our scene view. This is our, our editor uh, only or dev only view where, for example, we can zoom in and out. We can look past the level. And this is not, the player is not gonna see this. There's no camera or there's no other view associated with this. This is just uh, sort of a developer view that allows us to go wherever we need to go, start playing around with things. Uh, and so up here we have several different options for different tools that we can use. Uh, if we start playing around with these other ones, we can actually select items and start modifying them. But for now we're just, this one means that we're moving the camera without affecting any of the actual objects. So if you, it's a good uh, one to use, just in case. Uh, we, like I mentioned before, we can zoom in and out. That's the default with the scroll wheel. And now, we can start looking at some of these other ones in depth. The first one is the move tool, which just means when we have something selected in the hierarchy, for example, some game object, uh, we can actually move it by dragging these arrows. And in this case, 
I'm moving uh, this collectible, so the yellow collectible that's been seen. I'm going to zoom right in on it so you can see it. So this little gem, actually, it's hard to tell was a gem from that zoomed out view. But now I can see it's a little diamond or a yellow emerald or something. Uh, and we can move this back and forth along the level. So if I want to be tricky, I can place this right above the enemy. And now I've told the player that, hey, if you want to get this collectible, you have to jump over this obstacle. So that's one element of game design that uh, is immersive, is sort of telling the player what to do without actually giving them an explicit written tutorial or anything like that. You want this shiny object, you better jump over the dangerous thing. And so that's where we're going to keep it there. And I don't know if it's going to tell us anything else to do specifically. OK, so that's moving around a object. We can select any of these objects in the scene, although maybe not while the tutorial is waiting. Let's go back here. OK, while we're in tutorial mode, we, we're limited on what we could do, just so we don't break the tutorial. Um, but we could move the enemy if, if we wanted, instead of the uh, this game object. All we have to do is click on the enemy and have the move tool selected. Then we can move the, the enemy instead. Um, with the move tool, I think it just wants us to redo that. Yeah, just make sure we know how to do that. Next, and tutorial three, it's changing uh, colors. All right, so back in our hierarchy view, it's our hierarchy menu again on the left here. Um, maybe I should put the tutorial window in here. That way I can full screen this. There we go, that might be better. Uh, although I will have to keep the tutorial separate from everything else so I can still view that stuff. Let's make this a little smaller. And uh, something I didn't mention this time because we're just going through this tutorial, but just like other editors, video editors, uh, music editors, all these internal windows, you can resize, you can move around. That's, that's what I'm doing here. So for example, if I want to be able to see the tool tip screen, um, I can put it up here so that it's sort of more horizontal. Maybe I can read it better. Um, but for this case, I'm moving it to the, I'm trying to move it. Maybe I've, I've gone too far. <laughs> okay, maybe I've moved it to the point where it's now inside the tutorial space and so I can't move it again, but that's okay. Um, let's, let's just keep following the tutorials because I get very distracted very easily. So we've clicked on the player. We're back to the player. We can quote unquote frame the player by, I believe, double clicking uh, on the object or, well, the scene view, press F. Oh, okay, it's telling us a shortcut. We're gonna press F. With your cursor over the scene view, press F. Focus, F, focus. Let's try that again. Click on this guy. Next, press F. There we go. Okay, so with this highlighted, we know this is the object that we're selecting. We can see it in the inspector on here. We can see all of its fields that we edited, like the max speed field. And now we've zoomed right in on it. And you can see, uh, interestingly, in this case, uh, I don't know if this was automatic or not, but it's selected a different tool called the rec tool. And we can see the bounds of the player. The, the rect of the player. So uh, we'll probably look into more and see exactly what this rect represents, whether that's the collider or the sprite or whatever. But we can see this square outline. Now, the player will never see this square outline. Again, this is a, a tool view that we're seeing. Um, so we can get a better idea of uh, the different aspects of the player. Clicking next, we're back in the inspector view. And now we're on a different component. So I want to talk a little bit more about components before I uh, keep following the tutorial. So all these things that I'm closing here are all the different components uh, that can be expanded or, or closed. Transform is the most basic of components that every single game object in the Unity scene uh, will have. If the game object is not in a scene, it will still have a, a transform because it, it needs to know its position in world space. And that's one thing that is unique about using a game engine, especially Unity, all of the objects that are in the game, that are active in the game, exist somewhere in the scene in the, in the world. 
even if they don't have any visuals to them, if they're just managers, if they're just running timers or something in the background and they're running code, they still exist somewhere in the game world, but they likely will, will not be interactable. In order to be interactable and visu visible, they need to have some appropriate uh, component to them. So for example, the player, in order to be visible, has something called a sprite renderer, which takes a sprite or an image and renders it to the camera so that it has an appropriate uh, visualization. Some of the components here, briefly, we're going to edit the color of the uh, sprite, but there is a sprite here, which is the actual image that's associated with the player. And if I click on that, I can actually see that opening in my, my project window. But that's not what we're going to play around with right now. We're going to play around with the color. So we click on the color, opens a fancy color wheel, and we can change that to our heart's desire. Uh, we could even use a um, uh, an eyedropper tool. If we know there's something else in the game world that we want it to match, we can select that. Uh, it might not work right now because of the tutorial, but just to give you an example, if I wanted it to really match this bluish color in the background and be really hard to see against the buildings, you know, I could do that. But in this case, I don't know if it tells us to pick a specific color. You can probably pick whatever color you want. So let's make it really obvious uh, and not match the same color as the enemies and not match the same color as the pickups. Pickups were yellow, enemies were red, so let's choose green, because green's a bright color, and it's also not the color of the background. It's also my favorite color, unrelated. Okay, we've changed the color of the sprite renderer, and if you notice here, when I did click on the sprite and I opened all the sprites in the bottom window, we weren't playing around with those, but you can see that they're actually black and white sprites, which means that the player has no innate color, so by changing the color of the sprite renderer, we're changing the color of any sprite that is rendered to the player. So any of the animation sprites or any of the other sprites that the player is going to quote unquote play during its movement, it's, it's being edited by that. Uh, now, it's just reminding us that we can save and we should also play and test around with this new color just to make sure that it in fact does uh, stand out against the background like we wanted it to. So with our super high speed player, we can jump around, we can collect our objects here, and we can avoid those, those guys. We got a little bit further this time. If I can climb this wall, do I jumble jumps? Oh, wait, there's a platform to my left. That's probably what I need to do. Oh, no, ah, dang it, I touched the, the baddie. Okay, it's fine. We don't need to go much further in the game. We've tested our color and it's a bright, nice bright color. Okay, so that step, good, pretty simple. Next step, modifying those enemies, changing enemies, adding new enemies. Every time it wants to reset this menu, maybe I need to set that display as my main display. Let's stop doing that. Okay. Start tutorial. Next thing we're going to talk about is prefabs. Anything that's blue in the hierarchy and also this uh, blue... Um, blue objects here in the project view in the file browser that's built right into Unity. Uh, these are prefabs. Prefabs are prefabricated objects, as you, and that's why they're called prefabs. Um, these are self-contained objects or uh, fully, could be fully functional components or less functional components. Yes? Ah, yes, okay, good, good catch, it is that time. Okay, let's pause on prefabs, because prefabs are really complicated, and let's, uh, let's get a refresher, because I haven't even had some water. But... So we'll be right back, I'm gonna pause the recording, and Mina can take over again. Okay, we should be good again. So uh, as I was saying, prefabs, prefabricated objects, Let's see how the tutorial wants to use this. We're gonna use an enemy prefab in order to uh, add that to our game. And rather than, for example, creating an object, adding the enemy component to it, adding the sprite renderer to it, blah, blah, blah. We have uh, ready to go all an object that has all those things. So I believe we can go into the prefabs folder, find the thing called enemy, and now we can drag that into the scene. And if I press F, focus on it, we can uh, make sure that we, for example, align it with the ground, or at least see how the other ones align. So the other one looks like it's sprite, 
is almost touching the ground. So we're gonna make this one pretty similar. Um, and it may have a whole bunch of other components on it, which we may talk about. So let's just keep going, say, okay. Is the enemy where you want it to be? If it is, let's give it a try. Um, make sure we've probably moved it a little bit more. Um, when you're happy with position, select next and continue. Might want us to move it more, or it may want us to select this tool. There we go. So with the move tool rather than the rec tool, uh, I can just move it and not play around with its, for example, its size or anything like that. So that's why uh, it wants us to specifically use the move tool as opposed to um, the rec tool here. Because we can move things around with the rec tool and that's fine if we want to do that. But we risk, uh, for example, resizing it um, if we grab it by its corner or something like that. Um, I can control Z to undo that and go back to the move tool. So right by this tree, I think that's good as a start and it'll allow us to also uh, test it pretty, pretty quickly. Now, if we want to actually change the enemy rather than just the same as all the other enemies, we can rotate it, scale it, etc. Maybe we want him to start upside down and find out uh, what this blob enemy is going to do if it's upside down. Maybe it falls to the ground, maybe it has some other uh, physics on it, probably. And we can also uh, use the scale tool. We can scale it um, in one dimension only by grabbing a particular uh, axis here, uh, or we can um, scale it multidimensionally by sort of hitting this little square in the middle, and that'll grab both axes and let us, I don't know, make it, make it huge. Let's see what happens with that. Can our player get around it? Will it fall to the ground automatically? I don't know. If it falls to the ground automatically, we might not be able to jump over it. Okay, before, go back. Let us test it. Get out of the tutorial. It may actually want us to like save it and blah, 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 before we can start playing with it. So let's, yeah, it's, it's, we're gonna have to do it the tutorial way. That's okay. Next. Okay. Save. One of the last steps that's part of the tutorial, which we may not have to do here, is now that we know how to move the different items, whether it's the pickups, whether it's the enemies, et cetera, we know how to color things so we can change the uh, colors of stuff. We even taken a look at the sprites and how the sprites are set up. We didn't go in depth on how to change those, but we could um, change, for example, the sprite sheet that it's looking at. And we could actually now publish the game uh, or create a build for it at the very least. A build of the game would be an executable. On a Mac, I believe it's an app um, that we could then run without needing to be in the editor. This does a few things. Number one, lets us share it because we can share our files uh, without having to share the Unity project or the Unity editor. Number two, it strips everything out of the game that we didn't use, out of the files, projects, out of everything else, the assets that we might have downloaded, strips all that kind of stuff. So it's just the latest version of the game um, as it needs to be to run. And number three, it also um, gets rid of all the other stuff, so we don't have to worry about uh, logs or crash files or any of that kind of stuff uh, that would come with a debug version. We could actually have a, a fully functional app that we could share. And of course, if it does crash, you know, we can set it up to write a log or not, uh, depending on what we do. But uh, I'm going to say it's not going to crash. In this tutorial, we uh, accept that our micro game project is, uh, is a WebGL game. So we're actually going to publish it as a playable browser project, because that's a really quick, easy way. We can open it in our browser. We can also publish it as, like I said, a standalone, an app, an exe, whatever. Uh, just this tutorial just says, hey, you want to build a web game? You can do that. So we're going to actually open this uh, window here, the publish window. That's available right at the top. So if you have a full screen like me, you have to go up. And the option that's available right off the bat is publish it as WebGL game. So it just says get started. We're going to get started, publish it. Uh, it wants us to have a module. So this is an additional uh, HTML5 module that allows us to, for example, run uh, browsers games. So in this case, I need to go grab it. Just click that, and it's going to bring me to um, uh, this Unity Learn tutorial. It's probably going to explain how WebGL works. So in this case, 
make sure I have Unity Hub, go to the Install tab, and in their example, they're use, using a 2019 version, but we want to make sure that we have, uh, for example, WebGL installed. If we don't have it, we need to add build support to our editor version. So when you first installed your editor version, and actually I'll do it right now, uh, show you what it what it is, just in case uh, I didn't cover it earlier. Let's go back. Not we're not creating a project. We're doing a new install of some new version. Just pick pick this one, whatever. Uh, we have this window. So normally, if you're not really worried about doing anything else, you can just click install and away you go. But here you can see we have all the platforms build support for all the different kinds of games uh, that we might want to, or all the different platforms we might be deploying our game to. So WebGL is one of those. In this case, um, by default, WebGL is not something that's in the install. So what we have to do is go back to our install here, the one that we're using for this project, which I believe is the 2018. We can just double check here. Yeah, 318. So go to this install and add a module. So this might take a moment, depending on the size of the WebGL module, so 600 megs. Yeah, it might take a, a minute. And we're going to add now build support for WebGL. We could add build support for Android, for iOS, for all that kind of stuff. It's just it's not included in the Unity Editor because, well, as you see, there's some big modules. So we don't want to load that up at the beginning if we don't need any of it. But we can load all of it if we're going to use all of it, if we're going to publish to uh, both Android and iOS and PC and Mac, et cetera. So we can just only, we only need to worry about the ones that we need. So this will take a minute. While that's happening, at the same time, hopefully we don't kill the internet here, let's also get the um, FPS micro game template because we're pretty close to being done the tutorial for the platformer template. I might come back to it to show you a few other things that it didn't cover, but it's really just giving you the basics, how to move objects, how to drag in prefabs so you can put more objects in the game rather than duplicating the same one, etc. And the reason that we don't duplicate objects in the hierarchy and move them around as opposed to bringing them from the project prefab view and bringing them into the game scene is because the prefab is the set version that we want to always start from. So for example, this guy that we scaled, this giant blob, if I were to duplicate uh, the giant blob, it's of course going to duplicate its rotation and position and its size. So it's going to be just another copy there. And I could move it and rescale it. But if I wanted enemies that were consistently sized, or I wanted variants of enemies, I could have a prefab for the giant blob. I can have a prefab for the normal blob. I could have these different prefabs. And now I make sure that anytime I'm using that prefab, it has whatever saved versions it is. On top of that, I might not talk about it here, and I might have to come back to it. But if you save a prefab, it will apply the changes to all, all versions of that object in the game that reference that prefab. So if, for example, I saved this giant blob monster, uh, again, I can't do that. I'll have to come back to it. But I think uh, at least I, I can exp I have explained it. So somebody might have to remind me how to do that. And that'll be a good uh, thing to, you know, you, for a QA and a if you want to remember how to go back and do that stuff. Or for the design-a-thon, if you have questions during the workshop period, you're playing around in Unity. Um, we can answer all those questions. So this is almost done a little bit. Uh, oh yeah, let's go to grab the other templates. We're going to do a new project. We're going to go to the sample. Uh, actually, sorry, we're going to learning FPS micro game download template. So this uh, will now be the other template that we're going to walk through the tutorial of. And these tutorials are going to touch on different things. So the uh, platformer micro game, it's touched on the very basics of prefabs and enemies and moving things around. The FPS micro game, it's going to touch on a few more customizations. And especially if I go to the web page here, not this guy, I don't need this anymore. Oh, sorry, wrong thing. Go to this. Yeah, so some things about the platform micro game that we can expand on, for example. Uh, putting yourself in the game. If you want to have a custom sprite that's an image that you've taken, you can absolutely put in custom images from, from anywhere, from your phone, from uh, you know your computer, etc. You can change the name of the game, you can add title cards, etc. 
Uh, you can change the entire um, sprite pack that it's using. You can replace all the sprites, something that maybe you drew or another sprite pack that you found. You can add uh, effects to the, to the game. You can add sprite trails. Uh, you can apply a shader or tint the color of everything and give it an entirely different look. You can start adding animations to the different parts of the, of the world and, and create a more vibrant, dynamic looking world. And you can also create custom triggers so you can have specific events. Perhaps you want a building to collapse when the player has passed it, or you want uh, an enemy to uh, chase the player, but only once the player has passed a certain point or means been seen, quote unquote, or something like that. So there's all these different kinds of things we do. And then there's some more advanced tutorials. How can you start working with the Unity uh, sprite renderer uh, and the tile system um, to actually paint the level and create pl custom platforms and custom locations? Uh, more effects, changing um, different modifiers that are in the world, triggers, for example, speed triggers, bounce triggers, um, those create bounce pads and, and other things like that. Decorating the world by adding more elements, uh, both interactable and non-interactable. And then, of course, finally, sharing the, sharing the game. For example, if you have a make a web game, or, which we're about to publish, uh, how do you actually share that with other people? So all these different uh, things, and we don't have time to go through all of these um, because I do want to move on to the other micro game. So let's go back to the Unity Hub. It should be, should be good now. And it looks like, uh, if I cancel out of here, come back. Uh-oh. Uh, ah, I know what I've done. It's because I'm running on this other user environment. So it is not going to be happy to install uh, this package. Hmm. Not something I thought of. And if I have to switch users, then I'm going to end up messing up the recording and everything like that. Okay. I think we're pretty much at the end of the tutorial and all we had to do was download this and then go back into our Unity and then hit the publish button and it's going to open in a web editor. We don't need to do that. So let's let's just get out of this tutorial for now. Um, that's definitely something you can do in your own uh, time there. Um, in the meantime, let's kind of go back to what I was talking about briefly before we move on to the other micro game. So, here is my big enemy, it's just called enemy because that's the prefab that we dragged in. If we drag in another enemy, you can see it's the small one, it's the same size. If I click this guy, I can go to the inspector and I can see all the information about it. If I wanted to, I can change the scale in here, for example, instead of using uh, the tools in the scene view. And I can edit anything else about the enemy that I want as well. If I go find a sprite renderer, I could give it uh, a shade. And because the sprite is already red, uh, it has a default white shade, which means no shade, really. Uh, if I start shading it, for example, green, it can get it to a green color, but because the internal sprite's already red, if I get it to, I don't know, yeah, this bluish color, it's going to end up kind of being more purple than, than blue. But I can, I can start tweaking this around if I want. But what I really want to show you is at the very top are prefab options. So I can select this prefab, find out where this prefab is in my scene, in my uh, file browser here, built-in file browser. If I mix up my uh, fo uh, folders to get out of there, and then I click select, then you can see it snaps me to that, and it also tells me, hey, this is the enemy prefab. If I click on this big guy again, I have this, uh, this specific one selected, on the top here, there's something called the overrides. So this is going to tell me that in this specific scene, this specific enemy has transform, sprites, and uh, what other script overrides. That means that this specific version of the object has those changes. Now, before I do the next step, let's just hit run and see what happens, because I still don't know if this thing's going to fall or not. Okay, <laughs> it doesn't fall. It has stayed in its rotated position, and it's animating by going into the ground. Right, it doesn't look particularly good, but that's okay. Uh, the other one over here, it already has collision and all that logic set up. Same with this big one. If I run into it, I die. I don't even know if it's possible. Uh, oh, it helps if you jump. Yeah, jump. No, I can't get over. So obviously I've, I've trapped myself and that's not a good gameplay experience. But let's say I really wanted to mess with the whole gameplay experience. Let's rotate it back so it looks a little bit normal. And now let's go back to our overrides and let's hit 
uh, apply all. If I revert all, then I'm going to change it back to the base version of the prefab. But if I hit apply all, look what happens. It has applied those changes to all instances of the prefab, anything that uses the enemy as its base. And if I were to go into this specific prefab, I could see that, yeah, it looks all squished because now the base prefab is this squished uh, larger version. So all versions of it in the game now have those properties. So that's one way to quickly change the entire set of the game by editing one thing and applying your changes to the base prefab. So that's something that I think you definitely be using if, for example, you're doing uh, rapid game design and you wanna quickly change a whole bunch of things. You can do the exact same thing with the collectible token. For example, I can change its color. Maybe I make it red, so it's more confusing to see with the enemy because I really hate my players. Um, but I do want it to make it maybe bigger and easier to spot that it's a giant diamond. I'm going to move it. Now it's movement. Uh, that's a good question to see if its movement will be applied to all versions of it. Because if all versions of it get moved to the same position, that's not really useful, right? But we do want its scale and, uh, and its color to be applied to all versions of it. So now when we go to the, actually we can notice this does not have a prefab. So we'd have to create a prefab version of this and then all the ones in the game would have to uh, be using the prefab. So let's talk, let's do that really quickly because then we'll can move on. So in order to create a prefab, because that's something you'll probably be doing in order to use this functionality, uh, we can find this specific version in our project and it's gonna be the one that's highlighted. So here it is. And we can drag it, this specific one from our hierarchy into our project view, into our assets folder. And now we've created a prefab version of this object. If I drag it out from here, now I have two of the same prefab. And again, I can modify one, change its color, I can change its size. And if I want this one to remain unique, I can leave it like that. If I want its changes to apply to all versions of that prefab, I can hit apply all. And if I want this to be a different one that's uh, saved, I can go find it in the hierarchy, which actually ended up up here and drag that and now it says hey do you want to create a brand new original prefab with these all these changes or do you want to create a prefab variant and a variant is going to have all the same um, information as the base one but only keep the changes that the variant had which in this case was scale and color so if we change something from the base um, which i guess we'll have to see what that looks like let's create a prefab variant let's go back to the base one Let's change, uh, let's change its rotation because its rotation wasn't changed on the other one. Actually, I have to be our, it's Y rotation because, no, no, it's a Z rotation. Yes, okay, Z because we're in 2D, yeah. Because um, that's, the, that's the axis that faces the camera. Now, if we apply this change uh, to the prefab, click, Oh, interesting. Yes, we have actually changed. Okay, so the rotation is something that's not saved to the prefab. So rotation, or sorry, position and rotation are not saved to the prefab. Scale is. Let's change something else. Let's replace the, or let's change the size of the collider. I think I need gizmos on. Yeah. Where's the collider size here? Collider. The collider is the physics object uh, which the player actually interacts with. And I may, it may have gizmos off by default to not show the collider thing, which is kind of a weird thing to have, but let's see. Okay, interesting enough, the gizmo for collider is not showing. Which I thought it would. Okay, probably a bad example then. Let's not get stuck on this for too long. Um, instead, let's just turn the, coll the collider off. Oh, there it is. It actually is that line. Okay. So for some reason, our collider is one really, really big line. Probably because I've rotated it in some weird way. Let's reset it. Radius. 
maybe the collider is absolutely gigantic. Yes. Okay. So that circle is the collider. That's what it was. So the, the collider is actually does, is a, a much smaller number. So there we go. Uh, so with a small radius, that's the actual hitbox of the pickup, which means the player needs to hit that space to pick up the item. If I apply that and I go click on this other prefab, now I can see that the circle is the same size, 0 0.12 collider. So Anyway, all that to say that uh, variant prefab, any changes that you didn't make for the variant, but you make in the base will also apply to the variant. So you can have, for example, a whole bunch of enemies all based on the same original enemy, but having variants with different colors, different sizes, et cetera. And then when you change the base enemy, you can apply those changes to every enemy. Okay, so enough of this example. Let's close out of our scene. Don't need to save those specific changes, no big deal. Let's see how our download of the template went. Hopefully that went okay. Oh yeah, that, that went okay. Um, it was just the install of the WebGL that did not. So uh, new project, FPS micro game, UBC FPS. Great. Um, same thing as with the uh, platform microgame, there's an FPS microgame page with all the different moddable elements that you might want to do right off the bat. So uh, as you can see um, here, there's new game levels, shows you how to make those with something called snaps, um, how to make a snaps level into a playable scene level, um, adding different pickups. In this case, they're using a specific thing called the fireball, but you could use any sort of pickup or a custom pickup. In fact, um, I believe there should be at least one example of that in this game. Importing um, add-on assets. So as I mentioned before, there are a lot of free assets on the asset marketplace, and we'll talk about those in a second when we get to our next example, which we're running out of time for, but I'll try and be quick. Um, finding assets on the marketplace that are free so that you can quickly develop your game by adding in a bunch of custom elements. And in this case, the micro game has a bunch of custom elements in it already. And it's building all of those together. It's compiling everything. And if you're able to read some of these, you'll see, you know, uh, editor UI package, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Almost done, should be done. Done, okay, but again, it opened on this screen. Change that over once more. And bring over the tutorial window as well. So just like with the other micro game, it's giving us the exact same uh, situation here. Do we want to load right into the scene? Do we want to load the tutorials? Let's go through the tutorials quickly, but if we run into a point where it's like, I can probably talk about it better than the tutorial is going to walk us through it, then I'll, I'll just skip it. So just like with any other project, it's going to want us to get started by actually testing out the example. And if you're going to download any sort of asset packs, most creators have put some kind of example into their game. In fact, here there's even some text telling us what to do, eliminate the enemies. Didn't tell us our controls, but again, we can figure that out. Mouse, WSD, you know, this typical FPS thing. Uh, we can go see that there's a big open area here. Oh, there's an enemy. Let's shoot that not die. It's kind of weird because I'm actually not mirroring my screen here I'm on the other screen. There we go. And it even drops something with like a little health pickup. Is there more enemies? Probably. I think I see a radar at the top there. So telling us where the enemies are. Now I have this enemy that only came alive when I was close enough. If I hide behind the wall, it can't shoot me because the projectiles are hitting that. I can't shoot it through the wall either. So I can only really attack it by strafing. And it looks like there's some kind of logic here where number one, my gun has a cooldown. Number two, this enemy is probably shooting where I was, not where I am. If I stand still, it's gonna hit me, but as long as I was moving, it wasn't. So that's like very basic um, aiming AI. Just make it aim where you are, as long as the player is moving, that's it. Very simple menu, showing the player they won uh, and that they can play again or go back to the main menu. And it looks like we didn't actually launch this from the main menu, we launched it from the game scene. So this is an example of using multiple scenes to split up the game. So here there's a menu with controls. You can play with a, 
a gamepad. So if you want an example of using a gamepad in your game, the FPS micro game includes an input system that supports gamepad um, and of course keyboard, which is what we're playing on just now. And then uh, we can close this menu and go to play. Now we've loaded back to the game scene, I believe, uh, and it's we're, we're in the play mode again. So um, we can stop the runtime of the game now that we've seen sort of a very high level uh, of what the game is doing. And now we can start again modding some quick things. So just like before, uh, we have a few different factors here we can change. Uh, the gravity force controls the player's jumping height, uh, how fast they're going to fall, but also um, I believe because the way gravity is applying, gravity is applying to you as you are jumping up. So you have an acceleration as you're moving up. I don't think I need to reiterate the whole projectile physics, but you're moving up with some acceleration. Gravity is pulling you down, but only after your speed falls below the neutral thresh point is when you actually move downwards. So by modifying this downforce to be less, I believe it says the last, yeah, downforce to 12, then instead of 20, then the player will be more floaty. Uh, that's not 12, that's 12. Um, and also won't fall as fast because there'll be less, um, their, their acceleration will be reduced slower. We can then play with that. And I, I guess I didn't really jump in the last version because I didn't even think about jumping. So if I jump now, let's see, I jump to about the third check, checker box wall thing pattern. If I go back and set it back to 20, it's probably going to be only like the second checker box thing. I'm going to have to go back to here and play it. Uh, click there, jump. Yeah, so I, I don't even get to the top of the second checker box. So uh, that's just basic gravity that's running this player controller. And probably the, the 2D platform one had a, sa a similar mechanic that was um, driving its jumping that we can probably go back to and look at if we want it. One more time with our changes. And get out of that. All right. Now, we have a few rooms here. We have some, some floors, some walls. Next thing we're going to do is actually be able to add a new room because games usually involve more than one room. This example has a few. We had that like boss kind of room. That was pretty cool. So now we're going to see how we can add, for example, an entire room, not just one enemy, but an entire room to a game. Um, start tutorial. With our scene view, we're going to move around to where we need to probably add the room, which is probably this big square that they've left for us. Uh, and with this, uh, we, can, we can actually rotate uh, in place, for example. Not just not just dragging around the scene because we're now in 3D space. We have more access to worry about, so we can fly around with WASD. I believe. I think uh, it looks like we have to be holding right click in this case. We can like you know do a developer fly around, and we can see that there's actually a grid here which represents sort of the flat plane of the world or, or the zero plane of the y-axis. Um, just like before, we can zoom in and out. And now we're going to start doing more prefab dragging, drag and dropping. So uh, that's where a lot of our, let's call it game design, level design comes from. You may have somebody who's building the core prefabs, and then your job is to build the level by dragging those prefabs in, around and actually placing all the enemies, placing all the platforms, et cetera. Um, I think I want to go to the prefabs folder here. So we want the room alter prefab. Room alter. Uh, in fact, I'm going to use a search because I don't actually know which folder it's in off the top of my head. Oh, I had it. Room alter. OK, so there's actually a little preview window here that shows me the 3D room. And I can now drag and drop that into my world. 
Now, because I'm dragging and dropping it onto the flat plane here, the floor of it's going to be aligned, but the walls, um, you know, the entrance is not aligned with the other entrance. So I can position that more precisely if I'd like. Um, and I can even figure out exactly like what making sure the walls, for example, in this case, they're not, they're not overlapping, but a lot of games actually do use overlapping just to hide seams and things like that. So overlapping is not necessarily bad. Um, what we want to make sure is that, for example, this entranceway is clear. So you can actually walk through it to that other room. Now, because we have enemies, we have AI. And as you saw, the first enemy, I had walked into that open space, and then the enemy was suddenly behind me. That's because the enemies have uh, movement. They have an AI. They have uh, pathfinding is, is how it, it's called. And the nav mesh surface is what Unity uses to pathfind uh, different AIs, uh, any kind of algorithm that needs to find its way about in the world, whether it's for a 2D puzzle game or for a 3D shooter game that has enemies and stuff. If you need to do any kind of pathfinding with algorithm logic, uh, this is how we can do it. When we modify the world, we need to then reconstruct this navigation mesh. So we bake it, uh, which creates it and saves it to a file, which the game then references. All right, next thing is uh, just similar as before. We're going to change some colors on some objects so we can customize them. So again, we're going to go into, actually, we're going to change materials this time, which is even more interesting. So in the 2D world, we were able to change the sprite renderer and modify the actual color of the renderer to give it some different overlay. In this case, in the 3D world, our 3D objects have materials that they are um, using to get their properties for light, such as reflectivity, meta me metallic, there's a word for that, metallization? No. I've completely forgotten. Um, the, the ability to look metal or not, something metallic. Um, we're going to go to the floor because we want a floor texture. So let's find it. We can use the search box again to make it easy. Floor gray, Gr probably with knee. Yeah, floor gray with knee. So there's actually two here um, that it shows us. Selecting the first one, was this in the tutorial? So we can now modify this material which is being applied to uh, objects in the world. And again, once we've selected something in our project or our hierarchy, the details of that opens in the inspector window. So we can see all the different elements. And in this case, I believe my window is very squished because my tutorial window is over here. Okay, so let's move the whole editor. So now I can see all these different um, options, surface options, uh, surface inputs. These are all different uh, things we can modify in order to create, for example, smoothness, metallic uh, faces, uh, if that object or, or material should be opaque or transparent, make it like glass, etc. And everything that we need to do to, for example, change the color. So the base thing that we're going to change is the base map. What is the base color? Um, we could even uh, assign it a image or a texture that it could be based on. So for example, a, uh, if we wanted to have like a, a grass texture, then we could give it a grass image. That would be the base map. But in this case, we're just doing a base uh, as a solid color. But notice that when I change the color, it's not uh, changing the entire color. It's changing only uh, one square of this thing. And, and that's because the grid actually has uh, a pattern to it. It's not one flat surface. It's a, a material with this grid uh, shape or grid um, uh, texture to it. And uh, it was probably going to talk about that in a second. So onto that, uh, OK, I guess it didn't talk about it. If we wanted to make it more metallic looking, if we wanted it to be shiny, uh, we could change that. But we're only really going to notice this change if we have lights that are going to allow us that reflectivity. We can change the smoothness as well. So if it's a rough metal or a smooth metal, um, let's up those and we'll see what happens when we actually go and play the game uh, afterwards. But because I've stepped back, it wants me to redo this step. There we go. Okay, next. Okay, adding an enemy.
So we did this before, we can do it again. We're gonna go find a prefab. We're gonna go drag in an enemy. We're gonna call it the move enemy hover, hover bot. So there's the prefab. It gives us a 3D preview of the little guy. Drag that in. And we can then move it around and place its starting position uh, wherever we want. But because this has an enemy controller script on it, it is going to pathfind itself, probably towards the player. And it's going to use that new nav mesh that we've built. So if our player ends up in this new area behind a wall um, to this altar, the enemy will be able to pathfind up to it. Unlike when we change the player, it doesn't tell us to run it after every single uh, step. But let's do that now with what we have before we do the next thing, which is actually importing assets. So I don't need to talk about that in the next tutorial or final tutorial. I'm going to talk about it here. So here's that first enemy. And to my, oops, to my right is the second enemy that we just added, which is now on my left. And two enemies together at the same time killed me because I didn't actually click in the game properly. So let's try one more time because I don't want to lose to my own demo. Come on. There's the first guy overheating my gun. No. Let's get in here. Maybe we can climb up here. Use this cover. There we go. Got him. Okay. There. I don't feel I feel less embarrassed now. <laughs> okay, adding assets. Uh back. I just don't want to skip that. So the asset store is where we can grab assets. This is Unity's version of their asset store. Um, you could, of course, find assets on any kind of 3D object uh, store or, or um, web, website, whatever you want to call it. But those are may have only, for example, um, 3D models, right? Like a 3D modeling site just got 3D models. They're not going to have uh, any prefabs or any other components that are specific to Unity. Um, they may have animations, but you may have to hook them up. But things in the asset store are usually ready for uh, Unity projects to be added to. So in this case, there's a food pack. We're going to add more food for the uh, player instead of probably the little health icon. So all we have to do is in the asset store, add to our assets. We need to be signed in. Um, but once we've added it to our assets, in this case it's free, so we don't have to worry about anything. We then open the asset in Unity. It takes us back to our Unity window and opens this package manager. Now, this package manager, I talked a little bit more about it on the last workshop session, but this is the same sort of place you would go to get all the assets that are pre-installed for you in these sample packs. So the audio pack, uh, the animation system, those are all packages, but also all of these asset store uh, downloadables are also uh, packages. So uh, here we can see the version, we can see other information, we can go to the website, etc. We're going to hit download. That's going to uh, actually download the project to our local storage so we can add it to other projects if we want. But to add it to this project, we need to hit the import button. That's going to open this one other window. Let's go there. It's in my other screen again. Bring that over. Okay. Uh, which looks like that. So it shows us all the things that are in this asset pack that are going to be important to the game. And if we don't want something specifically, let's say we're, you know, we're lactose intolerant, we don't want cheese. Uh, we can toggle cheese off and it will not import that when we click the import button. But for the sake of the demo, let's, let's get everything um, just so we don't miss something. Um, once we've clicked import, I think this one was really fast. So yeah, nothing to import if we click the import button again. So sometimes that takes a while if you're downloading a big asset pack, but in this case, it was really fast. Back to the game. We can now import the assets because they've been added to the project. And in this case, I believe they're added in this new folder called the food uh, folder. And now we have all these food prefabs that are ready to go. And they are prefabs. They have uh, a whole bunch of import settings. And in this case, they're actually, I guess, 3D objects with materials, and you can see all the different materials that are on this object that make up, for example, the watermelon slice or the olive. Uh, it's probably a simpler example. So you have the, a few different materials that make up this object. And we can edit any of these materials if we want. So maybe we don't want green olives because uh, I'm a fan of the, for example, black olives. Um, the Kalamata olives are my favorite. So in order to do that, I actually need to be able to 
probably copy this into my own asset folder instead of using the one they have built in here. Food objects, materials. Yeah, so we can see all the information about the included material pack. We can see the 3D object, which is the actual olive. Oh, we can even move it around in here. Interesting, I've forgotten about that. Um, and we can, we can make sure that this is what we thought it was. Um, and we have a 3D object browser right in here. If there were any animations built into this thing, uh, we could look at its animations and its materials and stuff um, all in here. And here we could, we could change around the materials if we wanted. Uh, right now, you can see that there actually is no base material. It's just using whatever's the default values inside. That's why we couldn't edit, for example, this green thing. It's not actually a material. It's just a default. Um, so we'd have to create a material and add it, uh, which we could do here if we wanted. And then that would affect all the olives that we use in the game. Um, but again, we could create prefabs. We could have prefab variants. We could have a whole bunch of other things, have a whole bunch of different versions of the object. Back to the tutorial steps. Now that we've imported uh, the objects from the asset store, uh, we're going to actually, I think the same thing that's going to want us to do here before, which is actually publishing our game. So because I, I wasn't able to get that set up, let's, let's skip this step. And let's go to our final thing because we are running close to time here. So I'm going to close this game project. We are going to go now to the Explorer. 3D game kit. So this is again, this is the Unity Learn page about the Explorer. Uh, this is definitely the biggest demo, but it doesn't have the same kind of uh, tutorial steps as the other one does. So instead, it's sort of recommended that you are on the Unity Learn page and you go through these quick starts. So let's say you're in the Designathon, the Designathon is starting, and you're going to um, want to base your game off this 3D game kit. You, you know, probably want to set aside the first, in this case, maybe four hours of the designathon to walk through this game kit to see everything that it's capable of and everything you can do with it. And it's unlike uh, unlike the micro games, which they're a very short basis that allows you to just quickly add things. The um, the 3D game kit is a lot more involved and allows you to do a lot more with it. And I actually want one of these. I forget which one it is. Maybe the quick start. Yeah, let's, let's look at this video um, because this is going to show us what we could do making games without code. So this 3D game kit is similar to what we've been doing with the platformer and the FPS micro game. We can add new things and create entire games without really touching the basic code because we start with player controllers and enemy controllers and stuff that's already built for us. So we don't need to write those. This, this guy is also a really good YouTuber. I'm not going to play his entire uh, video, but I do want to let's uh, maybe go through the just the final bit of the, the demo. And we can see that it automatically generates this nice looking weird surface. Of course, all the good parts, all our places that are in this room. And finally, if we go back and play our game, we can see that if we enter into the field of view of our enemy, we will start chasing us around and then start trying to attack us. And if we attack him back, we can kill him with three strokes. So when I open the project pr project here, we're probably not going to have that enemy there that's going to follow us around and do all that kind of stuff. But following this tutorial, we're going to learn how to do visual scripting. We're going to learn how to set up enemies. We can do all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, I don't have four hours today to teach you all that. But this would definitely be something I would do in the Designathon, for example. Um, I did a very similar sort of uh, quick start uh, tutorial when I was learning the netcode for game objects uh, last 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 weekend. Um, and it was basically this exact same thing. It's, here's how this template works. Here's how these systems work. And here's how to start modifying that and make your own game. And um, let's see here. Yeah, OK, yeah, that's what I want to talk about. So let's go back to now the hub. Um, I already have the 3D game kit imported here that was ready to go. But let's just quickly go through how to get started, because you could then do this uh, on, if you have some free time before the designathon or at the start of the designathon, and I can refer you back to this video on how to get started. So we're going to go, we're actually just going to do a 3D core, which means empty 3D project. We know it's going to be 3D, but we don't really need anything else. And if we inspect it here, there's only a few packages which are included, which is the visual scripting uh, timeline, uh, which is for animations and stuff, uh, and some text, other some text things. So let's create a new project. 
want to make sure it's not the same as the other one, but let's just do 3D UBC um, Explorer. That's not three. That's a hashtag. 3D UBC Explorer. Okay, and then in order to actually get this asset, it here it has a link right to the asset store. So open this link in a new tab. And now here is the 3D game kit. Uh, if you haven't downloaded it before, it'll tell you add to my assets, but it's free. So we can do that just, just as easily. Once uh, Unity is finished opening this new project, which should be pretty fast, uh, we can then do the same thing that we did with the fruit pack and import this uh, asset pack into Unity. And we'll have access to everything that it includes. So it opens the package manager, fetches everything. In this case, I downloaded it earlier just to make sure it actually worked because uh, I was having some trouble with the 2D game kit because I think it's a bit older. Um, but we can hit import. This one will take a little bit longer because there's a lot more assets. In fact, I'm still waiting for the window to open. There we go. Uh, and in this case, the 3D game kit is an entire project that's ready to go. So it's telling us, uh, hey, you're importing this project, but it's a complete project. So if you had anything in this project previously, you know, it's going to overwrite those changes. Um, but that's why we created a brand new project. It's also warning us, uh, in this case, um, the project uh, is a bit of an older example uh, from 2018, or it looks like newest version was 2021. Um, so there's a few things it's, it's going to install and upgrade. So I'm actually not going to want to do any of that because it might take time. Maybe I can't do it now. Okay, yeah. Then it goes to the same importer, uh, which it, everything's selected because nothing would be in this project. So we import all and that would process. Now I'm gonna go back to the pre-ready one that I had just to save us time because we are we need to probably get out of this room. Uh, and it's this 3D game kit. So I can just open this project and it should have everything ready to go. Now, as I said, in this example, uh, it's more expecting you to have, for example, this 3D game kit walkthrough open on the side or on another window or whatever. So it would help walk you through all this stuff and built into the editor is less uh, tutorials like the other one. It's not actually gonna highlight everything automatically for us, but it also gives us more freedom to play around in uh, the editor. There is a nice little welcome message here. What is a game kit? It empowers you to create your own 3D platformer game without using any code. How do I use it? Well, read the manual. Uh, and then you can also give them feedback if there's something that kind of that hasn't uh, really helped you or you want some better uh, feedback on something. So if I open the assets folder, this is where I would start, um, you would have the scenes folder, which is not actually the game kit scene. This is the default scene that everything opens with. So you wanna be in this 3D game kit. And this is where everything's actually gonna be. This readme, that was uh, this thing on the side. And if I go and find uh, the tutorials, uh, this is some of the info that will actually walk you through how to use some of this uh, stuff. But really, I think all we have time for is to just go to the scenes and go to the start scene and see what this is going to load up. And this time, I'm going to go to the game window. So this is this is the game window. This is what the player is going to see uh, when we press play. So this game window represents any camera, any canvas, anything that's actually um, not the developer view, which is the scene view. So again, we can fly around the scene view. We can take a look at the environment. We can see that there's some floating buildings up here the player may or may not be able to get to. We can even see the 2D canvas that uh, the menu is rendering, and that's what it basically looks like. But because of the way canvases work, it's, it doesn't actually exist in that world space. It's just a representation of it. Uh, and we could play actually play around with things in here if we wanted. Like, I don't know if this is going to affect. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much what I wanted to show, is just getting that game kit started. You could walk through the tutorial, and I guess we're, we're going to get out of here. So. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining me.